everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist for Hippocampus, Zach Sutton. Zach. Hi, thanks for having me. Yay. Starting from the beginning, as we always do, we like to get to know a little bit about your past. How did you get started in music and on bass? My family is not a very musical family. I was visiting my dad's like cousin's boyfriend when I was like five, and he had a guitar. So I think that sort of kicked off the inspiration. I ended up taking piano lessons after that, not guitar lessons. And then shortly after that, my brother sort of recommended bass to me because he was sort of the guitar kid and he thought bass would be um, more suitable because, I don't know, he needed someone to play bass for him. Of course. And that's pretty much it. I grew up overseas, so this happened in Finland. And then it was about, we were about 11 when we moved back. And so sort of adjusting to the American, I don't know, schooling system, you know, it's either sports or something. So we sure. sort of avoided the sports having come from something different without football and stuff and just stuck to music. And that's kind of just been how we've kept going. Got you. And so did you pursue further formal studies or are you self-taught? Um, yeah, I mean, I took piano lessons, bass lessons when I was younger and then joined the after school program called School of Rock okay. when I was in high school. And that was sort of, you know, a study in itself, but it was just private lessons and then you sort of learn these songs. Mm -hmm. When I got to high school, I went to a pre-conservatory high school. So it was just jazz and classical training. So I studied jazz for a long time. And then that's obviously sort of a feeder school for, you know, conservatories for obviously more jazz or classical, like Juilliard's or Berkeley's. And I elected neither, you know, I just kind of, I went to a, the University of Minnesota for one semester and then dropped out. Yeah, gotcha. said, no, thank you. I hear you. Well, you know, and it's it's interesting because with everybody's journey is different. And mm -hmm. there are some people that can see a value in whatever program. If you were thinking of pursuing further jazz, you know, you, you might go, okay, I'm going to network here. I'll get to know these other cats. There's other values that are built in just in addition to learning the musical portion of it. But a, a lot of groups and a lot of musicians, it's kind of like, I, I need to get out there now and I need to be, be playing. And I don't see that a formal program is going to give me any other additional value, you right. know, other than the networking. So, I mean, there's no, no wrong way to go. Right. On to Hippocampus. Tell us about how you, you came into the group and you know, how that all happened. Jake and I um, met at School of Rock when we were about 12 or 13. We started a cover band when we were that age, playing in like dive bars around Minnesota, just doing like, you know, hair metal. And then we both went to the same conservatory high school and started a band there where we met other guys. That's where we met our other two bandmates, Nathan and Whistler. And just as they were about to graduate high school, they are all a year older than me. Uh, we started Hippocampus and, you know, didn't really have any aspirations for it. It was just another fun project for us to mess around with. And it was just, uh, I don't know, it had this feeling where it was like, wow, this is like actually sort of worthwhile. I want to invest a lot of time into this. I want to really see what happens. They all like deferred college. They waited for me to graduate high school. And then we were lucky enough to just play just one random show where we met a, a lighting guy and he said, hey, I know a management team. And we were like, please don't talk to us again. You're very scary looking. And he had like three strands of hair and it was like <laughs> terrible. So we like skirted him for six months, but he was persistent. And we met up with him eventually. He was like, I've got this practice space here. Let me introduce you to this management team. And they were actually a real management team. They were nice. They were yeah. very professional. And um, they, you know, helped us with recordings and then eventually get a booking agent and um, tours. So then it's just sort of been taken from there. Got you. Well, and the band's been going since around 2013, so you guys are uh, have been at it for a while. And I guess as so many musical groups are, as I was looking at your videos and things, it seemed like there was a, a, a lot kind of going on two years ago, and then until fairly recently, kind of a, a little blurb in time, mm -hmm. which again, with the pandemic, so many groups were like, you know, we can't tour, we can't... <laughs> 
<laughs> what's the point? Why are we putting anything out there? And especially groups that released records, they, you mm -hmm. know, they kind of landed just in the void because there wasn't the ability to do what people usually did. But Bad Dream Baby just dropped in, in June of this mm -hmm. year. And I, I'm guessing that is it kind of, I know there's another one coming, so it seems like this is kind of the starting to pick up momentum again. Right. The machine is churning back to life. Like you said, there's that two year sort of blurb of time and 2019 was like a big touring year for us. And then we kind of stopped just before COVID hit and we were lucky because we weren't one of the bands that had to like cancel a whole tour and miss out on like, hey, well, here's this record. We're so excited to bring it. To and then nothing, you know, mm -hmm. that's sort of almost wasted effort. Not that people didn't enjoy it, but they couldn't reap the benefits. So we were lucky we didn't miss a huge thing like that. So we took the past uh, year or two off to do that writing and recording. And so, yeah, now we have a lot of material yet to come. But uh, this EP, Good Dog, Bad Dream, is coming out this Friday. I don't know whenever this will be posted, but August 6th. And this is the first thing that we're releasing after this little break. And yeah, there's a song called Sex Tape. So we're excited about that. <laughs> there you go. There yeah. you go. Well, there's a lot to look forward to. And, and how do you come up with your bass lines? How, what's your creative process? Right. Well, in Hippocampus, we all sort of like share writing responsibilities. And bass seems to sort of fall anywhere in that process, whether it's like the, the catalyst for the song or just like the afterthought of like, oh, we need to add bass. Let's mm -hmm. just add bass. But, you know, I'm typically trying, I mean, I don't know how to say it like the most eloquently, but it's it's this blank canvas and it's the same process that you can sort of take to every song. It's a you might have your approach or there's all these different opinions. But what I like to do is typically just sit down here in my little makeshift studio and just, I typically record DI and I do about like 10 passes of the song, just recording it, seeing what's working. And then I try to hone in on something after that. And that process takes about like an hour or two. Mm -hmm. Just to really like, okay, this is, you know, I'm tailoring this uh, thing to this song. And then about after an hour of that, I delete everything and try to start again because I know my approach is like, it, it works. I can like play the thing, but I, I also want it to be uh, a challenge every time I do it, you know, to really fit something new to the song. Gotcha. So, yeah, so it's about shedding, you know, learning other lakes, other bass lines, um, you know, in between those. Just always trying to uh, learn and stay inspired. Got you. And do you draw any inspiration from other players? You know, like, do you have anybody that you kind of look at and you go, oh, okay, I want to tailor this line in, in a style of, like, fill in the blank? Right. Bass player for a band called Bombay Bicycle Club. Ed Nash, I think, is his name. He is a really versatile bass player. Really inspired me a lot, especially when I was starting and recording a lot i don't know i'm i i don't know how you feel about this but there's always like this identity that bass players sort of take on where it's like oh yeah i'm a bass player or oh i'm not a bass player you know it's sort of like this polarizing identity sure and i don't know if i ever really like accepted or um embraced like that identity is like oh i'm a bass player. i want to delve into like james jamerson or all this other stuff um like jocko to be a bass player and i love those guys i learned a lot from Jocko, but I always think that I'm, I don't know, it's like imposter syndrome. Like I'm not a real bass player. I don't know how to like actually write a bass line. Cause like, you know, it's sort of this instrument that a guitar player could pick up and they could like do it sufficiently, you know? So what makes a good bass player, a good bass player? I think that's an elusive question to me, but I don't know. Well, I, I, I think some people might answer that uh, the difference between the, the bass player and the guitar player is that the, the if a if a guitar player can i'm going to say trim off a lot of what they would normally do <laughs> mm -hmm. and leave some space you yeah. know because again the the guitar player's job so often is filling the mm. the entire space you know so like if you've got somebody doing like rhythm guitar they're just hammering away at chords or they're doing their thing and they have to do that because it kind of makes the canvas for the rest of the music to go on whereas the bass players in my opinion a lot of it has to do with creating the spaces between your notes 
yeah. and accentuating. You're hitting on these particular spots, so you're you're brightening and you're coloring what the whole rest of the musicians do. And I think you know, uh, Bad Dream Baby is a great example of that because what sticks in my head is your your pattern. You know, mm -hmm. so it's those notes, and there's there's not a lot of them there. It's like dot dot dot. That, yeah. that I'm like, okay, this is this is coloring what everybody else is is doing, you know. So sure. I think that is my. I started on guitar and I learned bass later on. And the big thing that my teacher kept telling me is I need to stop thinking like a guitar player, right. <laughs> and and stop noodling around so much. There's not a yeah. not a good place to do excessive efforts there, but. That's that's kind of how I see it, but you know it is again. I think there's no no wrong way or right way, and if it does inspire you to continue to challenge and kind of find your iconic sound and your identity, then you know it's just all part of the journey. I mean, you know, it's like who knows? I I talk to people that are in their 80s and they're still finding facets of themselves <laughs> to right. this day. So I mean, you know, it's it's just ongoing. But this is a great time to talk about how you're getting your sound. What are you playing on? When I'm recording like here or like at the studio, it's not even my bass. It's Jake. Uh, he has a Godin. And I don't even know the model. It's like the most basic sort of like Godin four string. It's got a pickup selector on it. And it just sounds incredible. I don't know what they did to that bass, but it's like the perfect recording bass. Everyone who touches it is like, what the hell? Like this is... <laughs> I've never even thought twice about Godin before, and now it's like my favorite bass. I think it's perfect for studio, not necessarily for live. When we're on tour, I play Fender 70s P bass, 72, okay. I think. And it sounds perfect, but it's just heavy as hell, and it sucks to like play two hours with like 20 pounds on your back. When I don't use that, I have a Nash jazz bass, okay. uh, four string. And those are sort of my like three favorite basses right now. When I'm on a tour, I play through an MPEG SVT Classic head, and typically an 8x10. Mm -hmm. And then for pedals, nothing too fancy. I have a reverb, just a Boss RB5 on my pedal board, Julia Chorus from Walrus Audio. I have a drive pedal called the 1981. It was made by the guitar player for Reliant K, Matt. I forget his last name. Sorry, Matt. But our... Our tour manager was on tour with Ryan K, and he became really close with the guitar player. And he, you know, when they're not touring, he likes to build pedals. So he's currently, you know, working on these drive pedals. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Do you have a preference in strings? Um, I told you not to ask me that question. <laughs> um, I, it's the Diodario. Uh, Diodario uh, Nickel, I think, like the basic one. I, I used to play DRs, but I think that was... Bad. I don't know. Those were like really bright and sort of mm -hmm. heavy, like a metal genre sort of thing. Sure. Uh -huh. Well, and you know, it it also depends. A lot of musicians, depending whether they need to change their strings off, and if they're looking for a real bright sound, if they have like an acid physiology. One guy I talked to uh, essentially told me that any bass that he plays he kills the strings within 10 minutes wow. <laughs> that they just go bloof and, and they're yeah. kind of gone. So he's had to apply. There's a, a product that you can put on your hands before he plays to yeah. help neutralize the acidity in his skin. So he doesn't kill his strings quite so fast. And, you know, it was like, Whoa, it's a, it, it has a particular special requirement for him. But it sounds like what you've got is, is, is working you know, well, and it's certainly giving you your sound. One area that I know a lot of musicians don't think about is instrument cables. Do you have any particular preferences in instrument cables? I was going to say that at the end of my little uh, like gear spot thing that I don't have. Like I don't know if that is a question that you were going to ask or if that's something people talk about, but I don't you know the first thing about instrument cables. I think it's, what do I have? This is a guitar. Uh, this is... Mogami. Mogami, that's a Mogami uh, patch cable. Gotcha. I, yeah, Planet Waves. I don't. I don't. Is there? Do you have a preference? Is there a best one? Well, what are, where I'll say is there's a lot of really good ones out there. I think it really hinges on what you are trying to do. You can get some really high end. I know, like Astarope, 
makes a very high-end cable that they've got some amazing technology. If you're using, especially even long cables, you don't lose sound on long cables, so they make a really good cable. Tsunami Cables makes an amazing cable as well. They do something really cool. They kind of customize where the, the it's the body that holds the plug. They do some really cool work with those. And a lot of the touring musicians that I've talked to really love those cables because they hold they take a beating. And mm. so you can throw them in a gear bag night after night after night, and they're going to come out. You can count on them. They won't fail you. I know a lot of people, before they could get exposed to those, Mogami, Monster, Planet Waves, all of them make pretty reasonable cables. I don't know that a lot of them hold up well under the rigors of tour. Right. And so that, that's kind of where you kind of have to thread it. And I, I know I, I talked to a couple of the Broadway pit players, and because of the demands of the show, like the guy, one of the guys that plays, I think it was either Hamilton or one of the other shows, but he was an Astro fan because they are brutally strong. And, mm -hmm. you know, night after night after night, he didn't have to worry about his cable fritzing out. And as, as I know, when I started playing, I basically bought what I could afford. So I had a, a three foot curly Q cable that was yeah. terrible. I couldn't even get very far away from my amp. So I was always situated really close and I would stretch it as far as it would go but you know it was not much to write home about but you know you pay per foot and three feet was about what I could afford at, the, yeah. <laughs> at that time so it really boiled down to kind of personal taste trial and error and again I do find that if you listen to a lot of the players that are on the circuits and do touring they have some very good recommendations but mm. A lot of those that I mentioned do just great. But right. back on back on to you and away from, from cables. Plans for the future. What does, I know that, again, we're at the kind of the proverbial light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. I know that you guys have some tour dates starting in September. So things are picking up just around the corner. What's in the future for, for you and Hippocampus? Yeah, so we've got a couple shows this September, but then a full sort of headlining tour next spring, February to April, and that'll be the real, you know, we, we sort of postponed planning a tour for fall of 2021 because when we were planning it, we didn't know what was happening with the pandemic as with everyone else. So when the vaccine sort of started hitting, all these bands were like, okay, yeah, fall seems to make sense. And we waited for spring and now that all this news of like the delta variant and all these scary things were like oh my god did we wait too long are we gonna have to cancel that tour too and it's looking very unlikely that we'll have to cancel that but uh yeah a tour coming up we've got this ep coming out and in minneapolis there's just a lot of bands that we love that we like to rep um we've gotten into production so we have like a little studio where uh, Jake and our producer, Caleb Pins, they work out of there and like to produce a lot of bands. So um, just, you know, hopefully something sort of community based here for people to look forward to, whether it's just a, a touring sort of small festival sort of thing, if you can imagine that, where it's sure. four or five bands on a bill with two nights or something. And then just supporting local artists here, stuff like that. So, yeah. Lots of good stuff to look forward to. Nice. Well, and I've heard that Minneapolis has, you know, Minneapolis St. Paul, kind of the combination, has a really great music scene. There's a, a lot of stuff going on, whether I I think it was just last week I spoke to an indie rock player uh, out of Minneapolis. And I know in the past I've spoken to this, well, a guy that does a lot of funk stuff. So there's a wide yeah. range of possibilities in that area. So it's always, always good to hear. And if people want to stay on top of what you guys are doing, is the best place to look hippocampus.band? Yeah, that's our website. I think Instagram is where we're most active. Our handle is the Halo Climb. And then, uh, yeah, Twitter. Twitter and Instagram. Excellent. And you guys are on Facebook too, I imagine? We are. Not super active, but we still are. <laughs> okay, some more Instagram nowadays. Yeah. I hear you. Well, yeah. Zach, we appreciate you taking time to chat with us and share your insights, your story, all the stuff that's going on. Folks, you've seen him here on Bass Musician Magazine, Zach Sutton.
Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.